Praise God. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the Gospel, or not the Gospel, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke a little bit today, but I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll be looking at 1 and we'll be looking at uh, 2 just briefly uh, and maybe a little bit of 3. But we won't be spending, believe it or not, a whole lot of time in these chapters. You know, we're going to look at a little bit of each. But we're going to be spending some time. I want to challenge you to have a fruitful New Year. You usually hear Happy New Year. But I don't believe you can really have a truly happy New Year unless you have a truly fruitful New Year. And we kind of get things backwards sometimes. In fact, happiness or the joy of the Lord is a fruit of the Spirit, actually. And there needs to be a deeper work that goes down in our hearts. So, in fact, go to chapter 1. We'll hit chapter 2 in a second and chapter 3. In chapter 1 of Second Peter, he's... Peter writes, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's writing to those who have obtained precious faith. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. I like that, man. I like to not just be a partaker of God's grace, but I like to be multiplied in my life. How about you? Amen? Seeing that His divine power that's God's divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and excellence. Now it's important to understand here that He's given us everything, it says, that pertains to life and godliness. Everything we need. A lot of times when you move in a home or something like that, if you're, you, know, you finally get a home or something of that nature, you, you move out of the folks' house or living with buddies, you know, you get at home, you, you have to kind of accumulate things through time and, you know, accumulate resources and what have you and, and you know, the proper, you know, things to fill in the kitchen, the living room and, and everything else. But can you imagine if you moved into a home and you had nothing and as you moved into the home, all of a sudden a couple big moving trucks pull up and they just pour into the kitchen, living room, uh, bedrooms, dining room, family room, whatever, everything that you could dream of, that you could need, that you could use, that could bless your life. And, and you realize, wow, it's actually picked better than I would pick, you know? And if you're a guy, you can admit that easily, right? You know? And you're just absolutely blown away. Well, that's what God has done for us. He's given us everything, more importantly than any physical, material things, He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything that we need is available to us through Jesus Christ, through the power of His Holy Spirit. Everything we need. And that's an amazing truth that we need to rejoice in. But you see, after, since he's done that, we need to avail ourselves of the grace that he's given to us. We need to appropriate that grace through faith and trust in the Lord. Amen? So we read in verse 4, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. These are verses 3 and 4, are some of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. For by these he has granted to us his, his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. It is through Christ, through faith in Him, that we've escaped the corruption of the world that's through lust. And that we have all these magnificent promises, partakers of the divine nature. That means God living in us, you see. And that means we have everything available to us in the kingdom. We have been seated in heavenly places. And the scriptures tell us in the book of Ephesians that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. So as Christians, we need to realize that we are the most blessed people on earth in the Lord God. That's Christians, true, genuine Christians that love Jesus. They have this joy that's just amazing, even in the midst of tough trials. Verse 5, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence. He calls us now. He shows God's part, you know. God's provision, God's grace. But he lets us know that we must appropriate His grace through faith. And that we must grow in this grace. Now for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence, and your moral excellence, knowledge, and your knowledge, self-control, and your and self your self-control, perseverance, and your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. There's these different characteristics that he wants us to grow in. In fact, these might be a couple verses that you memorize or you write down on a card, verses uh, six and seven, because they show you the characteristics God desires us to grow into to become men and women of God. 
And he says in verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you see that you're growing in these things. If these qualities belong to you. They're evidence that you're trusting Jesus, first and foremost, you know. But if they're increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're increasing or growing in these qualities, you won't be unfruitful. You might want to focus in and hone in that verse because we're going to be talking a lot about fruitfulness this morning because we want to have a fruitful new year. We want our lives to count. We want to make sure we, our lives impact others, that God uses us to impact others, that we ourselves are blessed, that our families are blessed, that our brothers and sisters in Christ and the churches are, are blessed, you know, and that we can bless the world and the community around us. So if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to be useless. You don't want to be, you know, unfruitful. Because look at verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. He's not warning the non-elect here. He's not warning non-Christians here. He's warning those who says he can forget their purification, their cleansing, from being, their, their washing from their past sins. You see, we're, when we come to Christ, we're not forgiven of past, present, and future sins. We're forgiven of our past sins. That's why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that's our future sins, and then in the present we confess them as believers, he's faithful to what? Forgive us of our sins, all of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? But that's why Jesus told us to pray. Daily, forgive us. Give us this day our daily bread, but also forgive us our sins as we forgive those our debtors. Amen? We continually need to go to the throne of grace. But you can get to the point, and it says it very clearly here, where you become useless, where you become unfruitful, where you become blinded, short-sighted, you don't see the big picture anymore, and you forget that you were even purified or cleansed or washed from your past sins. Don't let anybody tell you that if you're a Christian... Once you're a Christian, you're automatically going to irresistibly persevere to the end. Because right here, it makes it clear, as many other passages do about being blotted out of the book of life, that you can even forget that you were cleansed from your past sins, folks. So we don't want to be unfruitful. We want to continue in the faith. The fruit is simply the result of trusting Jesus. Amen? Okay, we're not saved by our fruit. We're not saved by our works. The faith without works is dead, true. But the works are the evidence of the faith. Amen? If we're trusting Jesus, okay, and we continue to trust Him, we'll continue to bear fruit at least to one degree or another in our lives. Amen? Verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never what? You will never stumble. The Greek word there means to fall. In the context here of falling, you see what it is. Becoming useless and unfruitful and, and blind and short-sighted and, and, and here failing to make your calling and election sure. In fact, the King James and the NIV render this actually better than the NASB does here. They both say, make your calling and election sure. Make your calling and election sure in verse 10. We've been called, okay? But you need to respond to that call. And whoever comes, he'll save so in regard to election, this shows you as well, as many other verses do, that, that our election is not unconditional, but conditional upon faith. Salvation is conditioned upon faith throughout Scripture. Even the book of Romans in chapter 4 uh, is conditioned upon faith. And even those branches, those Jews who were broken off because of unbelief in chapter 11, can be grafted back in again to the, to the uh, olive tree of salvation if they don't continue, it says, in their unbelief, you see. So your salvation is contingent upon faith he supplies everything but you must trust him faith is not a work the scriptures say amen it's by faith it says in, in romans it's no longer by works but faith is a condition salvation is conditional when we tell somebody that you know jesus loves them that he died for them we tell them they must meet a condition though they must put their trust in jesus amen salvation is conditional now it's interesting that right here uh he w tells us to make our calling and election sure that means we must confirm it. We must ratify it. We must put our trust in Jesus. Amen? 
if we're to continue as the elect of God. Otherwise, as I said, we can even forget that we were cleansed or washed or purified from our past sins. And we can fall, stumble. But he says in verse 11, for in this way, this means by continuing in faith, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be what? Abundantly supplied to you. Hey, I want to hear, Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Amen? Matthew 10, Matthew 24. I want to hear those words at the end of my life, and I hope we all hear those words together. Well done, good, and what? Faithful. You see, you continue in the faith. Because in that same message, in all the discourse, he said, he that endures the end will be saved in 24, 13. In chapter 25, the faithful believers, those who continue in the faith, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So we need to continue in the faith because we can, after we've been cleansed, go back to the world. And make no mistake, it says you can forget, as I've read to you, I think twice now, that you're cleansed from your past sins. Look at chapter 2 now, verse 20. Because we escape the corruption that's in the world through faith, we see. That's one of the hallmarks of a believer. But we're warned in verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how believers are described in the first few verses of chapter 1. But if after that's happened, they are again entangled in them. Entangled in what? The corruption of the world. And are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the what? First. It's worse then than before they were even saved. You can become a Christian and be worse off than before you were saved. Verse 21. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It would be better for us not to have known the truth than to turn from the truth in the end. Because Jesus said there would be greater damnation. Those are his words. Jesus said there would be more stripes for the servant who knew his master's will but turned away in the end. That means a greater whipping, you know, greater punishment in hell, guys. The Bible just doesn't teach about hell. I'm sorry to my Jehovah's Witness friends. It's very clear there's a hell. But it even teaches different degrees of punishment in hell. I've got three messages I did in a three-part series in depth one time on the different degrees of hell. There's so much in the Bible about it. Well, for the apostate, the backslider, who doesn't return to Jesus, it's worse than if he wasn't saved. He can't backslide and say, well, now I'm just all like the rest of the lost people. No, you aren't. You're way worse off than the rest of the lost people. You're going to have greater darkness, as it says in the same chapter. That apostates have even greater darkness, it says in 2 Peter. The last state, verse 20, has become worse for them than the first, the end of verse 20. That is, verse 20 would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Verse 22, it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. And a sow, right, a pig, after washing, after being purified, after being cleansed, returns to wallowing in the mire or the mud. That dog, after it's ejected the poisons out of its system, goes back to that poison. The pig, after having been washed from the muck and the mud and the scum, goes back to it. And that's exactly the picture he gives us in chapter 1, where he says you could forget that you were cleansed from your what? Past sins. Don't tell me that you can't. The scriptures clearly say you can. And it's a false teaching to say you can't because you're contradicting the word of God. Yet we're to go another route. We're to continue in the faith. Look at the very end of chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Because he warns a lot in Second Peter about false prophets, false teachers. He says, there are false prophets among the people. He's talking about the Old Testament times. Even so, there shall be false teachers among you who shall privately bring in damnable doctrines and lead people away through sensuality. It's this teaching, hey, you can just, after you've been saved, you can just do whatever you want. You go back to the world, you're still saved. No, you're not. Not if you return back to the world and you harden your heart and you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He says it's worse than if you would have never gotten saved. But he says to be on your guard. Don't fall for the enticing teachings of those who would teach you that you can live a life of lust and impurity before God and everything be okay in the end. And fall, he says, from your own steadfastness. I like the NIV here. And you're saying, man, you just said you like the NIV and the King James twice in the first part of your message. Why don't we use one of those? Because I like the NASB a lot better than the NIV in a lot of other places. Okay. But NIV is a great translation in certain areas. Second Peter, they did an excellent job in Second Peter. Bring out a lot of Greek nuances and stuff. You know, it's a thought for thought translation. But he says, but in the NIV it says that you fall, so you won't fall from your own secure position. We are eternally secure in Christ by grace through faith. That's how we're saved by grace through faith. As long as we continue in the faith, we're secure. I've got the joy of the Lord. I am eternally secure in the Lord. But I know it's conditional. I know I can't say, hey, you know what? Shine everybody on and become an apostate and become a, a meth addict and a drunkard and, and, and start chasing women and, and living the way the world lives, you know, and go back to the defilements of the world. I know that's a lie. That I'll be worse off than if I was never saved. Same is true with you. So we must continue to go forward in Christ. And look at verse 18, key verse, very last verse of this epistle, 2 Peter. But what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We glorify the Lord by living for Him, by growing in His grace and showing forth the praises of His grace. So we're to grow in grace. Remember he says, to, with all diligence to add these seven attributes, meaning to continue to grow in your faith in Christ. And you, you'll be increasing in these things. And here it ends with growing in these things. It's like riding a bike. You can't just stand still on a bike, man, before you eventually fall over. Now they, some of these kids, man, they can kind of balance for a couple minutes, but eventually you're going down. But when you're going forward, man, it's easy to stay up. Amen? And we're supposed to go forward in the faith in Jesus Christ. The, the fruit is the evidence that we're continuing to trust Jesus. So we want to have a fruitful new year. We read in 2 Peter chapter 1 that you can become unfruitful. It's huge, you guys. It's been my prayer, and it will continually be my prayer for our fellowship, that we are incredibly fruitful in our lives. Fruitful in our fellowship, fruitful personally in our lives, fruitful in our families, fruitful in the community. I'm excited about the Uganda trip coming up. You know, how many people are going and and it's uh, you know there'll be some behind praying but a lot of people are going which is awesome and we'll be able to be fruitful in uganda and, and help a lot of aids widows and aids orphans and bless a lot of people I'm looking forward to that but there's all these different areas god wants us to be fruitful in throughout this entire 2011 year and from not only now and this year but into throughout time and, and throughout eternity and it's critical that we continue to grow we continue to trust the Lord Jesus. Now, turn to Mark chapter 11, please. Mark chapter 11. What an amazing uh, gospel account. It's the shortest of the gospel accounts, only 16 chapters, but it packs a punch. And it gives you a really awesome uh, insight into Jesus' ministry, probably the first of the gospels that was written. And we find something very odd that Jesus does. I mean odd because all of Jesus' miracles throughout his ministry that you can see are overtly constructive. Constructive. This particular miracle was the only one that I've seen that was destructive. And it's in chapter 11, verse 12. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. So they leave Bethany, Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf. So at a distance, Jesus is hungry. He ministered so constantly. And he sees a fig tree that is full of leaves. It's in leaf. Okay? And he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. He basically cursed it. Cursed the fig tree. I say, but the fig tree didn't even have a choice because it's not the season to bear figs. Yeah, it wasn't the season to bear 
full-grown, beautiful figs, but there was a pre-season fig season. There was the first produce, which would produce buds and produce small figs that you could partake of. Not as yummy, not as good as the, the latter harvest that would come several months later, but you could still eat off these fig trees, you see? And he couldn't even find the small figs, the pre-figs on this tree, and he cursed it. Now, he, he said, may you never bear fruit again. And according to the uh, Gospel of Matthew, it was pretty heavy because the disciples later see the fig tree and it's all shriveled up and dead. And we'll see that in a second. But you say, well, why did he do that? Was Jesus just upset with the fig tree? No. It was an illustration. What does a fig tree illustrate in Scripture? Do you remember? Come on, somebody yell it out. Israel, amen. Lola's all humbly yelling it out. Israel, <laughs> you know. But it's a symbol of Israel. We've had a whole teaching on the fig tree as a, a picture of Israel. And if you look at what happens, if you go through uh, chapter 19, 20, 21 of the Gospel of Matthew, you see the same account of Jesus cursing the fig tree. But then you see him upbraiding Israel because they weren't fruitful. And he says that, he, that, that the nation would go into diaspora. It would be going to all the nations. God would bring judgment upon it. In 70 AD, just a few decades after this, that's what happened. And he said that he would, give, uh, his, he would give his blessing upon a people that would bear fruit. So he called the Gentiles. Now don't get smug and say, wow, we're the chosen people now. Because in Romans 11, the scriptures also say that God hasn't forgotten Israel. Amen. And that God will remember Israel again. And even now he's working and he brought them back to become a nation again. And then one day all Israel will be saved. And there will be Gentiles and Jews, saved people from each group in that olive tree, as Paul says in Romans 11. But... There's a radical illustration here that Israel would be judged. You have to understand the context of what's going on here. You see, Jesus had just gone, if you read the context, through his triumphal entry. He went into Jerusalem, and there was all this pageantry. Everybody was so blown away. He's rising the dead. You know, he's walking on water. He's healing the sick. He's unstopping the ears of, of, of the deaf. He's giving sight to the blind, and people are just blown away because, you know, these healings have touched everybody. So at the triumphal entry, they, they just roll out the carpet, you know, the red carpet, so to speak. There's all this pageantry, all this excitement, the palm branches, you know, called by many Palm Sunday. And they're, they're singing and ringing out the hallelujahs, praising him. But he knows within the week, those same people will be saying, crucify him, crucify him. Because guess what? It's a bunch of leaves. It's a bunch of show. They praised him with his lips, he said, but their hearts were far from him weren't ready to relinquish the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Zealots, you see. They weren't ready to relinquish the power that they assumed they had. And they didn't want him to reign over them. They wanted Rome kicked out, but if he wasn't going to use his miracles to eventually do that, they didn't want to follow him. Now, there were some, praise God, we saw Anna and Simeon in the Christmas story, you know, who feared God, and there was a, 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 you know, a uh, remnant that did fear and love the Lord. And Paul says all Israel was not hardened. There were those who accepted Messiah. But for the most part, the nation had rejected Messiah. Just as Isaiah 53 in the Jewish Old Testament says very clearly that the Messiah would be rejected and despised by his own. And it says in John 1, he came to his own, but his own received him not. And even though he made the world, the world did not know him. So Jesus is to be rejected. So he goes to the fig tree, which is a picture of Israel. He shows that there's going to be judgment because of unfruitfulness, guys. Because of unfruitfulness. That's the context there. Because right after that happens in Matthew, you continue to read on, and you see the judgments he pronounces on the unfruitfulness of Israel. So Jesus just wasn't hungry and was like, oh, bummed out, I'm going to curse this tree. No, it was a well-thought-out illustration, powerful illustration to his disciples of the judgment on Israel. But there's also an application for us. Because what did we read in Second Peter if we're unfruitful? It's worse for us than if we had never been saved. Amen? And we need to take this to heart that he wants to see fruit in our lives. In fact, go to chapter, or say in 11, but go to verse 20. Being reminded, and this is, well, let's look at verse 20. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the what? Roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. 
And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. The key is having faith, guys. In the context of having faith in God there is that they too will be able to walk in power, His power. But you guys, notice that it's shriveled. It's cursed from what? The what? The roots up. The key is the roots, folks. That's where it all starts. The fruit is a result of good roots. Amen? And that's what I want to focus on this morning a little bit, is not just the fruit, but the roots. Because if your roots are good, you'll be fruitful in your walk with God. Do you want to have a fruitful life? Do you want to have a life where you've got just blessings, you know, galore coming from uh, the, the riches of the Lord? Everything that pertains to life has been given to us, right? It's been provided for us. Do you want to have a fruitful life? Seek Jesus. Put him first in your life. Glorify the Lord because he deserves all the glory. If you don't want to have a fruitful life, you just want to have a messed up life that's empty and mundane and, and repetitious and barren and purpose and meaningless, just don't seek Jesus. Just do what the world says to you. Do you know? Then just do that. God help you though, man, because you're not only going to be miserable in this world, but you'll be miserable in the world to come. Now, we can spend the rest of our time, which we won't, on this particular cursing of the fig tree. I did a message call one time based on this, a whole message just on this fig tree called The Fearsome Fate of the Fruitless Fig Tree. That was like 15 years ago or so. But I want to look at another fig tree as, as, as well in a minute. But I want you to understand that this was first and primarily a picture of Israel contextually because God had called, God had cultivated, God had planted Israel as a nation. But we read that they failed to bear fruit. And we read in Jeremiah 2.21, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? He here he uses the picture of the vine. Sometimes he uses the vine, sometimes he uses the uh, fig tree. In Jeremiah 7.25, he says, From the time of your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets, Jeremiah 7, 26, but they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did, no, did more evil than their forefathers. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 16 says, but they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. In Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have killed the prophet and stone those who were sent to her. How often I would have, I longed to gather your children together as a hen does her chicks, but you were unwilling. You see, he wants to bless. He wants us to be fruitful. But if we're unwilling and, re and we reject the Lord's wisdom and we reject faith, what's left for us? Well, look at chapter 13 of Luke. There's another fig tree. Chapter 13 of Luke. We see another fig tree. And this time, Jesus, it's not a literal fig tree. Jesus talks about a fig tree in a parable. Very, very instructive parable for all of us. God, our Father, in your Son's name, I pray that you help us to learn from this. Chapter three, 13, verse 6. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it, and it did not and did not find any. Sound familiar? Sound like what we just read with what really happened with Jesus? Except fig trees often just grew in the wild. This fig tree isn't just growing in the wild. This fig tree is actually in a vineyard. Has all the advantages where it should grow. It's got a vine dresser, the gardener that's there. You know, it's got a hedge about it. Perhaps usually, typically. It has rich soil, nutrients to draw upon, watered regularly. This tree, this tree should be growing. This tree should be bearing a lot of fruit. Verse 7, And he said to the vine keep, vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Could be that that tree that Jesus had cursed, he went by for a few years, you know. But he's talking about more than just a tree right here. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? In other words, it is being blessed with all things that pertain to its life. Amen? 
just as we have been, just as Israel had been, yet it's just using up the resources. There are two types of people in the world. Those that take and take and take and take and take and take and don't give. And those who receive from the Lord, but give and give and give. Which type of person are you? A taker or a giver? We all need to examine our hearts. Don't say, man, he looked at me at that part. I looked at everybody just now. I get that sometimes, you know. But uh, it's important that we, what kind of people are we? This fig tree just took and took and took, but never bore any fruit. And the master comes and he wants fruit. He's put a lot into us. And if we're unfruitful and we don't bring forth, you know, joy to his heart, satisfaction, if he can't eat from us or partake of us in what he's doing, he realizes that we don't want him. It becomes, it's, it's clear to him from eternity past, but what's being played out in time right now. And that we, you know, are doing our own thing and that we're just sponging and parasites and just taking from him. He's to say, you know, like this tree, this tree was just using up the ground because he can easily cut that tree down and put a tree there that'll bear fruit, amen? That's what, that's what gardeners do. Verse eight, and he answered and said to the, him, let it alone. Wow. The vineyard keeper, okay, it's pretty interesting because the master or the owner of the vineyard wants to cut it down, but the vineyard keeper says, let it alone. Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Give it another year. That's what he says. Let it alone serve for this year too until I dig around it and put it in fertilizer. He wants to give it another year. Guess what we have before us, guys? Another year. Amen? We have 2011 whereby we can bear fruit, amen, for the Lord. Whereby we can allow him to cultivate us and fertilize us and be fruitful. This is very instructive for us as believers. How many of you want to be fruitful? I know I want to be fruitful. Now, there's an interesting thing here because we see here that grace is not irresistible. Some teach irresistible grace, you know. But there's many scriptures that show that grace can be resisted. There's many scriptures, for instance, in 751 of the book of Acts, Stephen says to those he's sharing with, as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, Jews that he's imploring to come to Christ, he says, how long will you continue? He calls them stiff-necked. How long will you continue to resist the Holy Spirit? They're resisting the grace of God in their lives. And here, there's all this provision, and there'll be a whole another year of provision now. I'm going to give it another year. All kinds of grace poured out upon this tree. But if it refuses, if it doesn't bear fruit, then the judgment will come. Then it will be cut down. Then it will be thrown into the fire. That's the figure that Jesus uses with the vine in John 15, 6. He says, the father is a husband, man. He's, he's the, you know, and he's, Jesus said, I'm the, I'm, the, uh, you know, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. Abide, meno is the Greek word, continue, stay, remain in me, and you'll bear much fruit. But in verse 6, he says of chapter 15, he's only talking to elect apostles there because Judas has already defected in chapter 13. It's only 11 elect apostles, and this is the warning he gives them. If a man does not remain, abide, continue, meno in me, he'll be cast forth as a, as a branch, thrown in the fire and burned. Same kind of warning. And here he gives them this warning, and this, regard, this is regarding Israel again. He's calling them to repentance. And if they refuse to, within that year, grow, he's going to cut them down. Are you saying, wow, 2011 is it for me one way or another? No. The application of this, though, is God gives us time. He even gave Jezebel space or time in Revelation chapter 2 in the letter to the church at Thyatira to repent because she was a false prophetess who was teaching Jesus' servants to eat things, sacrifice idols, and the children to commit fornication. He says he gave her time or space to repent. But time was running out for Israel. You see, there was a year left. You see, John the Baptist came, and then Jesus came, right? And you put John the Baptist's ministry together, with Jesus is about four years. And after about three years, guess what they're seeing? No fruit. But they're going to give it another year to see fruit in Israel. 
that the nation will turn. And we have to say, hey, are we turning? Have we turned to the Lord? Are we seeking him out? Are we crying out to him? You see, the, the vine keeper, the owner, is the Father in heaven. The one who intercedes is Jesus. Let it alone. One more year. In fact, the Greek word that's translated, let it alone, is the same Greek word that's used when Jesus is on the cross where he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. It's translated forgive. Let it alone right here. He's going to have mercy. He's, you know, it doesn't deserve to be let alone, figuratively speaking, and we certainly don't because we have free moral agency. But he's forgiving. He's going to let it go. Give it some more time. And how many times has God done that in our lives? Amen. He could have just wiped us out. Amen. But he forgave us. He's given us more time to prove faithful, to show our, that we want to trust him, that we will trust him. So this is really, really huge. He wants to see fruit in our lives. Just as he's come to the fig tree, he comes to us wanting to see fruit. What kind of fruit? In Hebrews 13, it's the fruit of our lips. Sincere praises from our hearts where we glorify God in our lives, guys. In, in our speech and in, in what we say and what we sing. You see, he wants us to be fruitful. In Gospel of John, when he talks about bearing much fruit, it's in the context of faithfulness, prayer, seeking to be soul winners, you know, glorifying him through bearing fruit like that. In Galatians 5, uh, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and peace and joy and long-suffering, gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control. Are we growing in those things? Or are we going the other way? Our hearts aren't right with God and we're bearing not good fruit, but the works of the flesh. It's one way or the other, folks. It's one way or the other. Now, the amazing thing is, it's, uh, the Lord cultivates us. He doesn't just leave us. Isn't that great? He digs around the dirt. He says, let me dig it up, dig around it. What's he doing? He's digging the dirt up. He's getting to the roots. He's getting some good soil down there. And isn't that what he does with us? We need to get right. So he digs under the dirt, beyond, under the leaves, and gets to what? The root. Because remember, it was shriveled from the roots up. The roots are what count. Where are your roots at? Where are you rooted? That's huge key. So first, he cultivates us. He digs under our dirt and gets to the root of the problem. And I love that about him. But a lot of us, we focus on, on the leaves and on the fruit, and we wonder why we don't have fruit, but we're not rooted in Jesus. In fact, according to mygoals.com, mygoals.com concerning a new year says, there were resolutions where 27% focused more on health and fitness. That was the most. 15 resolved to focus more on personal growth and personal finances. 12% resolved to focus more on their career, 9% on education, 7% on home improvement, 6% on time management, 5% on family and relationships. That's really sad that that's so low right there, by the way. Shows you our materialistic country we live in. As well as recreation and leisure. You know, most of what I just read is leaves, guys. Yeah. Some of, there's some fruit there, family values and what have you. It's at the end. But Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, amen? And then all of our needs would be met. And if you just focus on the leaves, it's never going to happen. You and I know that, you know? It reminds me of the prayer that this guy prayed. Uh, you might have heard this prayer before. He was thrilled at how well he'd been doing and sticking to his New Year's resolution. But he prayed this prayer nonetheless because he wanted help. Dear Lord, so far this year I've done well. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed, and from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more help. Amen. How many of you can relate to that? That we need the Lord's help, that we make these resolutions, and we just don't have the power to keep all of them. We need to accept the cultivation of the Lord and his fertilizer, so to speak. Amen? His energy, his working in our hearts. Because God wants to get deep into our hearts and do a mighty work within us. And it's huge. 
Don't just focus on the leaves, though. Let him go deep. Say, Lord, ask him. Say, Lord, go deep with me. Bear fruit. I love the psalmist's prayer in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, go deep. Go to my roots. Make sure I'm right with you. In fact, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Wouldn't you know it? I did a wedding yesterday, and I taped some of my notes over Ephesians chapter 3 because it comes right before Ephesians 5, which is that marriage passage, right? Verse 16. Well, verse, let's we'll start at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Guys, that's huge. Paul knows if they're going to be fruitful, they need to get to the root. There needs to be empowerment and enablement by God's grace in his, the power of his spirit, whereby their inner man is strengthened. I pray this all the time. God, strengthen my inner man. Fill me with your spirit. That's the root, because the fruit of the what? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, amen? That's the Holy Spirit living in you, controlling you, filling you, and you surrendering to the Holy Spirit. To be spirit-filled means to be Holy Spirit-controlled. So I've seen this prayer, and I pray it all the time. I pray for my brothers and sisters, God, fill us all with the Spirit. The Bible warns not to grieve the Holy Spirit. You do that by not letting Him have control of your life. And God's Spirit can be grieved. And look at verse 17. So that Christ may what? Dwell in your hearts through faith. There's the key. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, you being what? Rooted and grounded in what? Love. Brothers and sisters, the only way that you will bear fruit this year, that's eternal, that's for God's glory, that will count for time and eternity, that on the day of judgment, it'll be when it's well done, good and faithful servants, it'll be fruit that was, remains, as if you're rooted, the roots, and you're grounded in love. That your roots sink in. God is love, 1 John 4, 1 John 4, 16. If your faith is in Christ, amen? The Bible says faith works through love in Galatians 5, 6. So if you're trusting him, who is love, and you're looking to the God of love, the creator of the universe who made all things, he gives you all things that pertain to life and godliness, but you must seek him in faith. He's a person. We're not talking about some abstract idea that we come to discuss and you know, have our, intel our, our intellect stimulated on Sunday morning. We're talking about a concrete faith where we put trust in the historical person of Jesus Christ, the one who is the Christ, the Son of God, the living God, the one who died for our sins, who rose from the dead. We put our trust in him. He is with us in our midst at this time. He lives in our hearts through faith. The key is, are you putting your trust in him? Now you say, well, wait, that he'll dwell in their hearts through faith. He's writing the believers. That's really clear in chapter 1. Does he not already dwell in the believer's heart? Yes. But the interesting thing about that Greek word, dwell, is not the simple word to just mean dwell. It means to make home. Make, make home in our hearts. In fact, the New Living Translation translates it this way. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. I like that translation right there of that. You see, it's one thing for him to dwell in us, but it's another thing for him to feel comfortable and at home in us. Because if we're grieving the Spirit of God, amen, he's not feeling at home, amen. But if we're allowing God to control us, to lead us, we're seeking his will and not our own, he makes his home in our hearts. Isn't it true? Sometimes you'll go over home and you might feel somewhat uncomfortable. Like maybe you're not really wanted there or just, you know, it's just chaos or whatever. And there's other homes you go to and you feel welcomed and, and comfortable. We want to make Jesus comfortable. It's his temple after all, isn't it? We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we want to make sure that we are living for him and we allow him to fill up every crevice, every room in our home. There was a 
man that wrote a book years ago, My Heart, Christ's Home, a little tiny booklet. And he just shows Jesus in our hearts. It's a great little booklet because it talks about how he travels from room to room. He goes in the dining room and he, he sees, you know, things on the menu like lust and things of that nature that are ungodly. And he replaces those things with meekness and, and love and, and humi humility, you know. Goes to the dining room and he finds things that are ungodly and he replaces them still with other things. He goes to the closet and he finds hidden sins in the closet. And he cleans those things out and replaces them. It's a great picture of how Jesus comes in our hearts when we get saved. But now the process of sanctification continues whereby he cleans us up and continues to make us holy. And we progressively grow in sanctification. And if you're a genuine believer in Christ, you should be progressing in, in your sanctification. You should be growing in Jesus. And your heart should be his home. He should be able to hunker down and not be like a tolerated visitor, but a permanent resident. Amen? Amen? That's what he wants from us. That, therefore, we need to be rooted and we need to be grounded in love. It goes even deeper because he brings his word. In the Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says his word is like a sharp two-edged sword. Amen? That's how he cultivates the ground. He digs it deep. And you know what? That bone divides bone and bone marrow. Amen? The bone and the bone marrow, he, it, it divides it. How do you divide that? Because it goes deep. It goes really deep. Your bone marrow is what produces your blood. Divides soul and spirit. That's pretty deep. We don't even understand how soul and spirit really relate. We can speculate based on certain scriptures. But his sword goes deep. So we need to be in his word. If you want him to cultivate and you want him to deal with the root and strengthen you, you need to be in his word, amen? So I want you to encourage you to be like Paul, like the psalmist, search me, O God, and know my inner thoughts. Strengthen me by your spirit, Lord. Make your home in my heart. Be comfortable, amen? Pray, number one. And number two, stay in his word. Because the sword of the spirit digs really deep, amen? That means this year you're going to be committed to the word of God to reading through the scripture, or reading a lot of the word of God. We have studies midweek. You, you know, if what are you doing midweek where you can't be here? If you're saying, well, I can't because I got this, that, and the other going, understandable. But if you're just being lazy watching some Hollywood sitcom, which probably doesn't have the best message, that's compromise. Amen? If I mean, there's a, you can wake up in the morning and... I love the, the psalmist. How was he strong? He is another tree figure right there. He was like a tree that was planted by the what? Water. Very first psalm, the very first few verses. It's an incredible, incredibly beautiful psalm. And I'll read it. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. God's word. And in his law, he meditates day and night. You catch that? That's normal Christianity, folks. Meditating on God's word day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Brothers and sisters, do you want to have a fruitful new year? Do you want to have a happy or fruit and a fruitful new year? Be involved in prayer and seeking the Father's face. Amen. Stay in the word. Let Jesus get deep through prayer. Call upon the name of the Lord and continue to surrender every room in your house to him. Amen. It's his house. He made us. And continue to read his word that not only digs the dirt up, right, but transforms our hearts. We're transformed by his word. You want to be transformed? You need to be in his word, amen? The Bible talks about being renewed by his word. It says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, amen? Offer up your body as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to him. I want us to have a fruitful new year. I know that's the Lord's heart. And he gave Israel an opportunity. The verses I didn't read, one through five, you know what the key for them was? 
Two times he said before he gave that parable about the three years and the one year. Two times that's where he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise, what? Perish. He said he was going to give them another year. And he did. Some repented, but many did not. And the nation was judged. He gives you a chance to repent. You know, in the old maps they used to make before they had modern instrumentation, you know, and they really didn't know what was, you know, a continent away. <laughs> They'd have these old maps, and it said, these maps, when they didn't know what was to come, you had this statement, beyond this point, there may be dragons. Okay? Kind of crazy when you think of history and dinosaurs and many drawings of dragons by just about every ancient civilization. It's kind of a trip. Beyond this point, there may be, may be dragons. They didn't know what the future entailed. They didn't know often what direction to take. Oh, we know there's a, a dragon, a great red dragon revelation says, Satan, in the future, especially he's manifested. He's manifested now, but in the tribulation period, he'll come having great wrath. But you know what? The Lord is victorious over him. He crushes him under his feet. Amen? We know beyond whatever point, Jesus is victorious. Amen? We have a roadmap into the future. We have a new year ahead of us. We know what's going to happen in the future. We know that we will dwell with God forever and ever in his kingdom. Amen? But you know what? You may not. You may be going the wrong direction. You may be living a life that is ungodly and you're not seeking Jesus. It's an act, or it's not even an act. You're just drug here by your, your husband or your wife or, or your parents. But you know what? The map says take a U-turn. That's what repent means, metanoia. To do a 180, have a change of heart, change of mind. Put Jesus first, amen, in your life. If you want to have a fruitful new year, Jesus Christ needs to be first and foremost in your life. Otherwise, there'll be nothing of eternal value, amen? If you don't know God today, and you're like, man, I want to have a fruitful new year. I don't want Jesus to just be comfortable in my heart. I want to know him to begin with. Understand and just admit that you're a sinner that needs to be forgiven. You've broken God's holy law. And Jesus died on the cross to forgive you your sins and pay for those crimes against God. And if you repent and put your trust in Jesus, you'll be saved. Let's bow our hearts before God. If that's you, just say, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I know what Joe is saying is true. I believe your word. I believe you love me. I believe you sent your son to die for me. I'm so sorry for my sins against you, Father. Please forgive me. I thank you that you will, based on your promises and your character. I repent and I put my trust in Jesus right now. I thank you for eternal life. I thank you for not only a fruitful coming new year, but a fruitful eternity with you, living in my heart and me living in your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, let's pass out the cup and the bread. Meditate for a few moments, please, on the, on, just go before the Lord and let him know. Ask the Lord to help you be fruitful in your family, in your church, in your personal life, whatever you have before you. Just ask for forgiveness and meditate and be thankful for what the Lord did on the cross as we contemplate communion. Amen. Aren't you glad God's patient with us? Amen. Gives us another year. Amen. Man, I'm sure grateful. Man, I'm grateful he didn't come back, you know, when I was a teenager in rebellion. I'd be in trouble, man. So would a lot of you guys. Amen. You didn't know Jesus yet either. And he's still patient, and his patience means salvation to many lost people. Father, we thank you so much for your great goodness to us, Lord. We pray, Father, that this would be the most fruitful year we've ever had as a fellowship, Father. We pray that in Jesus' name. Individually, Father, that we would be fruitful in our lives, that we would seek you in prayer, that you would dwell comfortably in our home, that you would have every room, that it would be yours as our Lord, our Master, our Savior, and that we would be in your word so you could go deep and cultivate us. And so you can feed us and fertilize us with your same word, which is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, so we can go into the future and have victory over the dragons because Jesus Christ is our Lord. We thank you, Father. 
over the bread, which represents your son's body, which was given for us on the cross in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the cup, which represents your son's blood that was so freely shed for us on Calvary's cross. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. We have an awesome God. Some of the fruit he looks for is praise. Let's give it to him. We praise you, Father God. We love you. Hallelujah. You know what? In heaven, before the throne of God, they're just the angels who are powerful in us are crying out, Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know, the, the, the believers that have already gone to heaven are praising him with their lips. One of the fruits he wants is the fruit of our lips, praise. Let's determine to be a people of praise this year, amen? We're in the midst of our circumstances, as tough as they get, we still praise God because he is good, amen? And we still love him. And instead of just giving him a clap offering, let's do that again. But each and every one of us, let's give him a praise offering with our lips. You don't have to scream it out and be the loudest person here, but at least be bold enough to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and lift up your voice and give him praise and just tell him you love him and praise him. Let's do it. Praise you, Lord God. We worship you. We exalt you, Lord. We honor you because you are worthy of all praise, Lord God. You are the awesome, holy one. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Turn to somebody and wish them a fruitful new year. God bless you guys. I want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. Uh, our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.